Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Uh, welcome back from the Thanksgiving week. Hope you uh, are are rested and, and the, was it tryptophan, whatever it is that makes us sleepy has finally worn off. I think we just finished up the leftovers last night. I don't get, I don't understand the sleepy after turkey. I don't, I don't get that. Maybe it's because I'm in a constant state of sleep deprivation. I really can't tell the difference <laughs> post meal or pre meal. That reminds me of the spinal tap line about, uh, it would have hurt me more if, if I wasn't so heavily sedated. <laughs> um, for me, coffee is, is, the cure to what ails us so uh, yeah but apparently there's some chemical release um so what, what what's but, what's on the matt lewis traditional thanksgiving table well it's entirely traditional i have to say this year we went the elitist route my my wife erin who is a, a terrific cook and foodie got this turkey that the queen of england eats we had to order it and uh, apparently it's like nine dollars a pound, which wow. is I'm told insane, insanely expensive. I mean, I, I get like um, you know, uh, you know, lo- local turkey here when that's and that's like four bucks a pound, and I, yeah, I, I thought that was and, on the pricey side. So this is supposedly uh, it's as close as you can get to wild turkey, but still be domesticated. It was good. It was great. We had a good time. Uh, you know, just the traditional fixings. We 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 keep it uh, you know very traditional. Uh, nothing. You know, pumpkin pie and all the good stuff. <laughs> good times. We had we had five kids under the age of three in my little uh, townhouse in in Northern Virginia. So that was that was fun. Very nice. <laughs> See, I, I want to get uh, we 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 have the Thanksgiving at our house, which usually means you get to dictate the menu. But uh, we're still under the thumb of my mother in law, <laughs> who insists on things being a certain traditional way. And that means I can't get mac and cheese on the table. I, I and I feel like that's like the modern American classic Thanksgiving now. I think that's been presidentially blessed, but uh, I I can't yeah, I can't weasel should, that in. You should get what you want as long as you don't take away I'm, the turkey and the stuffing. You no, should no, no, add no. like my wife. You know, my wife Erin is uh, of, of Italian heritage, <laughs> and they have spaghetti and well, turkey. You, you know, know, my uh, my. No uh, my my, I'm half Italian. I'm used to always being some kind of pasta, whether it's Thanksgiving or Christmas. Um, uh, usually um, uh, lasagna, uh, and that's been kind of shunted off the table as my mother-in-law has asserted her authority <laughs> as not well, being properly. You got to make make her an off, make her an offer she can't refuse. <laughs> uh, speaking of the Godfather. Um, I, I wrote a couple weeks ago when this Liz Cheney, Mary Cheney spat happened that, uh, you know, you never, you never take sides against the family. You never tell anybody outside the family what you're thinking. Of course, the Godfather was on AMC on Thanksgiving one and two. Um, not, not three. And it seems like, it seems that Dick Cheney, uh, and the piece that I, I wrote this piece saying that. I, saying that, that Mary Cheney uh, was out of line by publicly attacking her sister. Uh, this this sort of is a you know, breaking of, of family ties that bind. And I was, you know, pretty widely criticized for saying that. But it seems that Dick Cheney has taken my advice, uh, at least according to ABC News. Uh, there, there's a story that he he's said the, uh, the attack, quote, unquote, the attack launched on Liz by Mary and her wife has quote has has been quote dealt with. Um, no no tell if, there, if a horse's head has wound up in anyone's bed, um, but it seems like you know I I quoted at the top of my story I quoted the Godfather, you know don't ever tell anybody out never take sides against the family again ever, uh, and I quoted uh, from Breaking Bad uh, la, la familia es todo. Um, the family is, is everything, and uh, so I saw this as, as as a as an example of of Mary Cheney uh, going public with what should have been a family dispute settled in the family, and I think that Cheney agreed with me. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been better at this point for just Dick Cheney to not talk and just not just let let this the whole flap lapse? And let Liz start talking about other things. It's obviously not what Liz wants to talk about. 
Uh, there's no way for her to talk about uh, gay marriage ever again without um, uh, re um, uh, reinjecting all of this uh, bad blood. I mean, even if Cheney now says it's dealt with, obviously, you know, Mary and her partner haven't retracted anything. You know, it's it's still out there, sitting on on the table. Um, why? Well, this perhaps, why be involved? This why? There. Why should Daddy, you know, be looming as a as a as a behind the scenes shadow uh, throughout this campaign? It doesn't seem to be doing Liz any favors. Well, first of all, this perhaps made their Thanksgiving uh, experience together uh, quite difficult and challenging, um, and maybe that's you know maybe that's why it's at the top of his mind. I will say, look, I, I think that what Liz Cheney said and what Dick Cheney said were in response to questions. You know, Liz Cheney was on t- on TV asked about gay marriage. Dick Cheney was at an event and he was asked about this situation, as opposed to what Mary Cheney and her partner did, which is sort of go public with something. Um, look, I mean, you know, if you work at a company, sometimes people that your, your colleagues in your company do things that you don't agree with. You shouldn't go public and attack them. That's just not good protocol. Certainly that shouldn't be your first move. Um, maybe you, maybe they, what they do is so egregious that you leave, that you have to quit. And, and, uh, that, you know, if, if it's, if it's that egregious, you may have to leave and speak out against it. But by and large, you don't go outside the family. Um, what, what, if you're what, what, is, team, what is Mary lost in doing that? I mean, the person who's lost out of this is Liz. And Liz is the one who has suffered again. I mean, she already was not going to win this race anyway, but it's made her, it's, it, it's certainly, you know, if she had any hopes of a, of a miraculous comeback, this story doesn't help her. Uh, that was Mary's intention, it seems, to make her sister pay for de- denigrating uh, her her marriage. Um, so why is why should Mary be the one to feel bad about this? It seems like she got exactly what she wanted to have this exchange, and Liz is the one that suffered. Well, Dick Cheney says it's been dealt with, so I don't know what might have been said, but you know, if if my sons, uh, my two boys, if one of them were running, putting himself out there, standing for office, putting himself on the line, I would expect him to be attacked by the world. And, and for all sorts of people to come after him. But I wouldn't expect my other boy to publicly attack him, no matter what. Even if he took a position that, you know, was I was, you know, diametrically opposed to, I would never dream of publicly attacking him. Um, and so I think that's part of it. No, who knows what Dick, what Dick Cheney said to Mary? It's unclear. One could, uh, we could speculate on what might have been said or what sort of threats might have been lodged. But, you know, I, I just I, I'm of the opinion that, um, you know, I think what Mary should have said was, you know, I love my sister. I think she's absolutely wrong on this issue. I hope she'll evolve. But we live in a free country and she's entitled to her opinion, even if I find it, you know, to be incorrect. Um, so but the no, the notion that Liz Cheney can't have this opinion um, is also problematic. I, a year ago. A little over a year ago, Barack Obama didn't believe in gay marriage. Um, this but, is an but, issue but that those, I think those are, those is, are not, is legitimate those are not to disagree on. They're, those are not equivalent situations. I mean, Obama had been doing m- many other things in favor of gay rights just short of that line. He was clearly on the, the side of expanding gay rights and hadn't gone to that point yet. Liz has done nothing for gay rights uh, and is now actively trying to roll back what has been achieved. So I don't think... What is she doing to actively try to roll back gay rights? Well, she's saying that these, these, these rights that have been uh, established in many states and then the, and the federal benefits that have been sanctioned um, in, in concert with that, she's saying she doesn't agree with. Um, okay, well, that, that's a perfectly legitimate political point of view, Bill. Look, that does it. She might be in favor. Well, first of all, let, let me just backtrack and say, as I've mentioned before, number one, I don't think Liz Cheney should be running for this seat. Number two, I think she's pandering to the voters of Wyoming. I think she would very quickly evolve once in office on this issue. So let me just begin by saying I'm not a an apologist for Liz Cheney. 
Having said that, the position that she is now espousing is perfectly legitimate. And you, because you don't believe in gay marriage doesn't make you a bad person or a bigot. She may be, maybe she believes in civil unions or something else. Um, but I, I do fear that it's now becoming a situation where you're a hor- you're perceived as a horrible person if you happen to disagree on this issue. We live in a free country. Those people can well, disagree on these issues. Well, well, and, well, and Mary's disagreeing. I mean, Mary, I don't think Mary is saying you're not allowed to have this opinion. She's saying if you take this opinion, this is what you get back from me, your sister, who you claim to like uh, the partner she has chosen for her life. Uh, you know, and that's where I think she crossed. But that's where I think Mary crossed the line. And I know this puts me in the minority. I know most people disagree with me on this, except for, I think, Dick Cheney and probably Don Corleone. <laughs> um, you don't take sides against the family but did, did it, publicly. But you did don't it, tell did people Liz outside do the this family first. what you're thinking. Liz took a position Liz didn't and mention insulted Mary, Liz a didn't family mention member Mar- first. Liz didn't mention Mary Cheney by name, number one. Number two, Liz was responding to a question on TV, so you give her a little latitude. It's not like she went to Facebook unilaterally. And attacked her sister. She was responding to a question. She didn't mention her sister by name. She's talking about a public policy issue on TV. I think people, you know, doesn't all. It's not like a prepared. And, and the other thing is running for office. When you run for office, um, you have. And again, I think you can expect the slings. And I don't expect it to come from a blood relative. And that's why I think this is a betrayal, and I think that this is indicative of selfish, individualistic nature. This would have never happened in a traditional society, never mind the gay marriage issue. I'm talking about going against, publicly speaking out against a family member, would have been much, much more rare in the past. I'm sure it's happened historically. I think it would be much, much rarer. Not just because, the other point is, you know, now we have Facebook, so you don't have to, like, hold a press conference and think about what you're going to say and, and change your mind. You can just go to Facebook on a whim in the passions of the moment and uh, say whatever strikes you. Uh, maybe- I mean, I don't, I don't have any sense that Mary has any regrets of what she did. Maybe she does, but there's no ind- indication of that. Uh, but I, I think what... Well, let's see if she speaks out now after this ABC News story. Maybe. If she goes... If she- <laughs> I, think what's, what's, I think what was so upsetting to, to Mary is... Uh, there is no obvious reason why Liz had to pander like that. There are, there are plenty of ways you could have glossed over the question on TV. You didn't have to come down so firmly uh, opposed to uh, equal marriage rights. Her own who's was not exactly, you know, a squish and already uh, embraced the right of, of his daughter uh, to get married. Um, so she wouldn't be doing anything that was unusual for, for the family brand. Uh, and it was doubtful to be a, a flashpoint in the primary in the first place. Um, well, look, I, I just look. I, if I if I, I agree with you, I would have told her, "Look, you way fuller understanding. Um, you need to do a message um, on this, but you got to." with your sister. I mean, that's what I would have told her, just politically speaking, never mind right or wrong. It was being used against her in Wyoming. And uh, it, it was part, it, there was a, it was an orchestrated effort to use that issue. And her Um, the NZ people, and his, not specifically the NZ campaign, but NZ's allies, are attempting to do whatever they can to undermine that. Better, but also, uh, they, there's an ad about how she's been on MSNBC, like attacking her because she's appeared on MSNBC, questioning her conservative bona fides. This was clearly, this issue was clearly going to be maybe not a TV message, but a whisper campaign about her that I do think she had reason to affect her effectively. Um, well, uh, well, we'll agree to disagree on on Liz. Uh, now, you are having your own uh, uh, intra-party battle. 
Uh, family family feud, yeah. Uh, you you are uh, uh, not that you've been attacked person or anything, but you are uh, crossing swords with uh, the kingpin El Rushbo. Uh, in terms of uh, how conservatives should react to uh, the reason, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with the crossing swords reference with the kingpin. But we'll, we'll go with it. Um, cause Rush was, went on his show the other day and tore into the Pope, uh, yeah. for, uh, making comments that were critical of, of trickle down economics, uh, uh, you probably know that quits better than I do, um, uh, but of, of, uh, of un- unfettered markets, uh, right. and the consequences that, that, that it leads to inequality, uh, and Uh, you know, this is straight up Marxism, uh, as if the, as if now the, uh, a number of conservatives that were welcoming what, what Pope Francis had to say, which I, I, and I, I think your and, and other like my sort of commentary did not get a lot of media attention, whereas Russia's did. So I think kind of fleshing yeah. out. In the conservative movement about how to, how to look at um, uh, what Pope Francis is doing. Sort of defending Pope Francis or explaining the nuance behind this, but so did Jim Pethokoukis at AEI, so did uh, people like Ed Morrissey at Hot Air and Ross Douthat at the New York Times. And I actually was on Morning Joe and the, uh, the opinion elites making this same point. So you cannot run um, for Senate in Wyoming now, is that correct? I will not get elected. That's the story behind how the Daily Caller got its name, Daily Caller. Uh, I do not. I've, I, I've, written, I've written about this, but I'll tell you. Essentially, Dick. This, this is a local accident. Local accidents happen. You don't. And uh, so this is, this happens right. Could be wrong. Um, so they went to the local newspaper, and uh, I, I, you know, it's in my story. This is a couple years ago that I wrote this, but the local newspaper was called something, the something caller. Mm. Um, so Nelson and Neil Patel are about to. Um, and by the way, this doesn't constitute as me telling tales outside of school, and I've written. Um, they were about to launch the Daily Caller. Things about the New York title. And Neil, and Neil had remembered the time that Dick Cheney shot that guy in the face, <laughs> that the local newspaper was called the Something Caller. Um, and that's where they got the name from. So long story short, if Dick Cheney hadn't shot a guy in the face, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today <laughs> or have a job today. So, um, but to bring it so back, is, you were, you were on Morning Joe. I'm Mr. Moosey talking about uh, your take on Pope yeah. Francis, other conservatives' take on Pope Francis. Right, right. And, and so my point here is, has glommed on to Russia's 
criticism as if, and look, Rush has every, every right to make his point, and I understand where he's coming from, but it does bother me that that sort of been portrayed that that, that conservatives are, you know, because Rush Limbaugh accused the Pope of you know, straight up Marxism or whatever, that that's the, uh, the sort of the conservative take on it. As I've mentioned, there are many of us have, have written, you know, sort of in, in favor or explaining what Pope Francis was was getting well, at. Wait, wait, what, what is um, the positive conservative take? It, it would seem that he was criticizing conservative economics. So what 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 would how would a conservative find something to agree with in that? Well, first of all, I think that if you were to ask Pope Francis, he would probably agree that and, and you know his encyclical is quite long, and they're pulling number one, they're pulling out a very small portion of it to make this point. But essentially, you know, I, I certainly believe that free markets have brought more prosperity to more people than any other economic system, certainly more than socialism. Making this point. But this really goes back a long ways. I mean, Adam Smith, everyone remembers his book, The Wealth of Nations. Uh, what they don't remember as much is his theory of moral sentiments, which was essentially about personal benevolence. And, you know, Smith creates this thing, an impartial spectator, which is sort of a conscience <laughs> of whether or not things are good or bad, right or wrong. I, in my original piece, quoted the sort of greed, selling of sex, reminds traditional societies. And so there is this tension uh, that conservative opinion leaders and, and uh, you know, have, have, have long recognized that exists. And there's nothing wrong with sort of speaking that original um, because I, I was about uh, which is about this ama the, the, the birth of right versus left this amazing debate that took place between Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine French Revolution and uh, from uh, Burke's book about the and corporations and uh, the sale of church lands, attorneys, agents. He goes on and on. I mean, this is, you know. So my point is um, you could have taken that quote from Burke, certainly out of context, and uh, just as you could have taken Pope Francis' words out of context, Pure Marxism. Of course, that would have been a wild distortion. Complex. And that I think, um, you know, I, I certainly think that, that Rush uh, is within his bounds to have an opinion mm -hmm. about this. But it, it does bother me that uh, that the media has largely ignored what I think more conservatives. Uh, generous reason why the media focus on Russia is that public set.
for food stamp. I mean, this this presumably should be an example of this is not uh, uh, this is targeted to people who are uh, who don't have enough income to feed themselves. So why? Try to stand out. It was rough. Staying life. Uh, that does not seem to be an argument that has a lot of currency with congressional Republicans right now. Well, you do see people like Mike Lee, who recently gave a sort of you know high-profile speech about poverty. I think people like him are pretty good about talking about these issues, and I certainly hope that there'll be uh, not no pun intended, but a trickle-down effect from. Uh, the opinion leaders, people like Douthat and and more others to be elected, um, that these ideas will. Um, I do want to warn that you know, although I'm perfectly comfortable with um, a man of the cloth, uh, the Holy Father, and others uh, being critical of the capitalist system, I think it is clearly the the best. The, there's a moral case for free markets, where in fact. More people than any other economic system become prosperous. Uh, having said that, I'm perfectly comfortable with criticism of the economic system. I do think there should be a distinction made, however, uh, between uh, you know philanthropy and, and personal charity versus the government essentially taking by force my money and giving it to someone else. I think there's there's got to be a balance act there. Clearly, compassionate. Poor, um, that's an entirely different question over, and, and I think as a society and as a government, we need to certainly be cognizant of greed and, and things of that nature, but, but there is a question over uh, to what degree government ought to be involved in this versus uh, individuals. So that is a big debate amongst conservatives, as you can understand. Well, look, I think Ed Morrissey has written about this at Hot Air and really debate, and I think that it's healthy. I think that this is one of those discussions that is that is positive. So uh, go check it out. Now, um, on the Democratic uh, side of the aisle, we're starting to see uh, these sort of year-end retrospectives on Obama. Uh, a rough year, agenda stalled. Uh, saying that Obama's got to get rid of some of his political team. Uh, and you had Ron Fournier, the National Journal, go uh, all out. And say, fire your team, Mr. President. That he needs to say, like, uh, uh, no, he said, fire, well, it's fire yourself, right? And well, was, I mean, let, the headline was you fire can't. your team, but his <laughs> argument was, you need, to fi- you need to get rid of your team so thoroughly that it completely overhauls uh, Obama's own. Scrap, <laughs> Mr. President, <laughs> because um, I mean, there's a number of reasons why. One is that it's it's not accurate to say that he's just losing everything. I mean, he ju- he just won. He he held his Democrats together. I mean, look there. He's got headwinds with Republicans wanting to obstruct and Democrats in tough twenty four you know, that want to put some in him. He held them together to end the judicial filibuster and get his not. 
D.C. Uh, court of Appeals, second most important court in the country. He held the Democrats together uh, during the budget showdown. Uh, him winning Ukraine, what the Times called perhaps the most progressive uh, in 30 years. Uh, so uh, considering that he's got a Republican House that doesn't agree with him on most things, we can expect that we get a lot of stuff passed. Uh, yes, healthcare, healthcare.gov is, uh, is a headache for him. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but that seems to be a fixable headache. It is in the midst of being fixed. And it's it's better now than it was in October. There's no reason like that it will not continually get better over time. So why that should... point I, I let you get a, a word in uh, let, let, let's say that all and, uh, and there does be a big change and there, there could be people who were who are found to be directly incompetent about healthcare the trick thing uh, the notion is got to fire everybody uh, and and that is a magical way to turn on one's political fortunes. Well, that's not much by by history. His name was Jimmy Carter, and it didn't work very well. Uh, he, he he was having a real rough go by 1979, such a rough go that he gave a speech, uh, which gets derided as the malaise speech, but he never actually never said that word. It, it was really called the crisis of confidence speech, and in the speech, he really lays bare. His own weaknesses. He's very. It's 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 a remarkably candid speech, where he he gets into his managerial style and the criticism he's taken from it, uh, and then broadens out and says, you know, we have this nationwide crisis of confidence that doesn't believe that our institutions can get the job done, and we need to have a renewed sense of American spirit. And when he gave that address, he it 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 struck a positive chord, and people rallied around it, and his polls went up. Then a few months later. At what he thought would be a way to follow through that, he demands the resignations of his entire campaign. And that does not go well. That feels like panic. It feels like desperation. It feels like blaming other people when he was sort of taking some own responsibility before. Now he was passing the blame off on others, it seemed. Roosevelt, who in 1930 was having a rough go, and his polls were as low as they were as, as they had been in his presidency. Uh, he had the recession of 38. He lost the uh, his, his his attempt to purge conservative Democrats in the 38 midterms. Uh, he was still bruised from the court packing debacle. And so was it was having its own problem. It was having this John Doe problem, which is actually very analogous. Obamacare's 834 problem, which is currently uh, a concern that the data that the website is giving the insurers is inaccurate and it's going to mess up all the enrollments. Social Security had a problem called the John Doe problem in that the, the, they had these wage records from the employers that were missing key information, like their wages or their Social Security numbers. And there was panic that they wouldn't be able to cut the checks right away. Uh, and...
about to fix it. Uh, and we don't call Roosevelt a bad leader for doing that. So there's something to just sort of, you know, uh, you know, keeping your chin up and, and working through problems, not just to uh, panic mode uh, when, when the pundits tell you to panic. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think that there's going to, I don't think there's going to be a mass firing. I don't, I don't think there needs to be a mass firing for Obama to recover. He'll recover from this if the website is fixed and people uh, st- uh, people use it and people enroll. That's what's going to fix things. Well, look, I think that there are... First of all, the last... Um, you and I did a uh, inauguration where I think we nailed it. Um, all the problems that plague second terms, and certainly it has plagued, Barack Obama's second term, and it's been a year of Barack Obama. It's not just the website. And look, I think that the back end is messed up. People show up at doctors and they're told they're not insured. Uh, you're going to have uh, more adverse action. You're going to have uh, people... Uh, the year from now. So there are going to be a lot of things happening, even if the year for a cleanse his administration. But I think you're right that it would be a mistake to clean um, a pretty good post over at the Washington uh, where she made a couple of really smart points about this. Um, one, it would look, you know, it sort of feeds into the notion that, that there's a catastrophe. First term, I'm quite term loyalist with doing better jobs. Uh, I think there are, there, you know, there are a lot of good reasons why Obama uh, shouldn't take Ron's advice, even though it's a very good column. Uh, I do think he needs a symbolic purge of be fired. Even now that that on MSNBC, I feel that it would not, uh, it would not be wise to have, uh, Relatively new, like that's a move. Uh, I'm not saying double down necessarily, but I think the the abandonment strategy is is probably also a mistake at this point. Talking about this, the second term curse, which you talked about at the start of the year. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the, the main, uh, legislative reform effort that was really had a shot of getting. A planned agenda item. Can't be a reach. I mean, it wasn't a. 2012 because it's not gonna get the Republican House, so that's. that's well, it would make a difference, uh, and, and so far it has. Um, so I don't, I don't look at that as being big evidence of of, of, of second term blues. Um, but here we are with immigration; it gets through the Senate on a bipartisan vote. It's stuck in the House at, at the moment. Uh, and you know, the Hill newspaper even ran a two-part series, you know, you know sorry, why immigration is dead. Uh, just uh, 
Boehner wants, I, I believe Boehner wants to do immigration reform. It doesn't beat up on Boehner. It doesn't say they're trying to kill it. He says, I believe Boehner wants to do it. And if Boehner wants to do it in a, in a piecemeal way, that's fine. Because that's the, the sticking point that Boehner is. I, I don't want the comprehensive bill that said we want to do a series of bills. Obama says, fine, do a series of bills. No problem. Let's just do them all. Do all, do all the pieces. Just, but you want to do them pieces, go ahead. Uh, and Boehner reacts to that this week by hiring director of immigration policy for the Bipartisan Policy Center, who used to be John McCain's immigration staffer and who is a big believer in a pathway to citizenship. So, despite this, uh, it was a F minus year, second term curse, nothing happening. Why are Obama and Boehner seemingly on the same page and working towards an eventual immigration compromise, which would be the big for his second but if, we, if, it gets, as, if it's passed in March who cares <laughs> reform just got kicked up a notch or two. So, as you know, Flake's part of the gang of six. Um, this is clearly a signal to him. It, here's the interesting part. I think if you told, you know, right after... Right after open to immigration reform, Marco Rubio starts championing it. At some point, the tide turned again. And then I think at that moment, comprehensive reform is bad. It's not going to happen. But we maybe can pass a piecemeal approach. I think you would have had a lot of people say, oh, that's see more and more stories of, you know, grassroots conservatives attacking Boehner and, and accusing him of being a sellout. Um, so, you know, the the sort of internecine squabbles on the right. The, the, the debacle of the website has really overshadowed everything. But this could be... Um, this could be where Republican infighting picks up. But frankly, that's where, strategically speaking, even though you know, Bill, that I'm a longtime supporter of immigration reform, strategically speaking, in the short term at least, I know there are a lot of long term reasons why Republicans ought to. Um, why would you start sending signals to change? And to give a line to a uh, and to They both do it. Uh, and I don't think that what happens in other issues bleeds into that. Um, you know, 
approval, Republicans will still want to ha- not alienate the Latino community for the next generation. Businesses in the Republican coalition still want to have a steady flow of, of immigration. That doesn't change because healthcare.gov had a bad day. I, I, I think we all one issue bleeds into the next, and that often, often, like politicians look at them in silence. Uh, I, uh, I think that uh, immigration is going to be a lot easier for Republicans once the primary filing deadlines pass, which is largely in the spring. And I think they're kind of you know inching their way towards that, and not and not rushing. And I think they also got kind of bumped off track because the budget shut down and whatnot. But they may have been planning for for springtime votes anyway, and that was all. Look, you may be right, Bill. You may very well be right. And um, but let me just say, I think it would be a mistake to underestimate how volatile this issue is and how. The grassroots conservative base, um, I mean, this could be a revolution. This could be the end of Boehner's speakership. Maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he's going to retire anyway. Um, but people who champion this, if it's Rubio, both very prudently from a political standpoint, um, there, there will be a price to be paid. And, well, I mean, and if, if and it's, it, this will be viewed as a sellout, as as a, as a betrayal by the ruling class in Washington, and you just, I, I'm just saying, don't underestimate the fallout here. This will be a big, big deal, and uh, if it happens, the base will be really pissed off, and uh, there will be blood. Well, I mean, let let give Boehner some credit here. This is a guy who seems to know how to. Had a stroke as caucus, <laughs> able to do the debt default deal in a way that was basically total capitulation <laughs> without engendering a fatal party split. You know, by you know doing this whole kabuki dance up until the, the very last minute. Uh, so yeah, there have been some there are some anecdotal reports that about half the Republican caucus is. Of of who of those who are currently undocumented, uh, if you have a series of votes, you have standalone bills. So some people can have pick and choose what they vote for, but they all pass. Uh, and this all happens in April or May, and it's too late for any primary challenges to manifest before filing deadlines. Uh, yeah, there'll be a degree of backlash, but to what end? What where where do they go? <laughs> They're 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 not they're not going to show up in in November and they let, they let Democrats uh, take over the House. I that's a maybe like I mean you I mean if, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just all I'm saying, Bill, is and you again. You know where I stand on this issue. I think it's the I think that immigration reform and you can, the devil's in the details. But just you know, speaking of, just broadly speaking, I think immigration reform is the right thing to do. And I think it's probably the right thing to do for political and policy reasons, long-term political. Being in the conservative movement and around the conservative movement is that this is a bigger deal than people may think. Um, I, I've predicted when, when Rick Perry started speaking uh, about this issue, I predicted it would be very damaging to him and could cost him the nomination. I mean, when when Marco Rubio started doing this, I always thought it was a profile in courage, but incredibly risky. And I would have advised him as a strategist, don't do it. So <laughs> I'm just saying uh, I do. I think that th- this issue is is much more dangerous uh, and, and has the potential for much more turmoil on the right than others may appreciate. And I think. It's misleading to look at polls that tell you that most Republicans want immigration reform because it's about intensity. It's about the base. It's about the people on Twitter, on the blogs, on the radio, uh, the people who go to the work camp. To, to use the spinal tap uh, 11. So it's a big 
suspect that a lot of the Republican elites are saying, you know, yeah, we need we need these folks to stay in the coalition. We need their grassroots energy. We need their small dollar donations. But if all we do is care to them, then we're we're a minority party for twenty years. Uh, we have to, we have to go beyond this base if we're going to get anywhere. And so we got to find a way to uh, cajole this forward. Uh, and this and, and the the votes are there to do it. We just got to find a way to do, manage the kabuki dance and manage the procedure in a way that we can at least try to m- mitigate the intensity. Of the uh, right. At least all evidence to me says they are trying to do that. I mean, if they want to just say this wasn't going to happen, they could have barely. Yeah. Could be like they're so kind of killing it, so they have to pretend that they're trying as hard as they can, but. Right. I do want to remind remind my conservative, my conservative friends that the Senate bill, I mean, cast as amnesty, but the process for the pathway to citizenship would have been like a 13 process involving all sorts of hurdles to jump through. Um, It's not like a mass amnesty on day one. A piece. I won't go through it again, but five, you know, five reasons that conservatives ought to support immigration reform on principle. So I'll throw that out there as well. Well, should we leave it on that note, sir? Well, I may, you know, my, my, after I, my, uh, and I was <laughs> beloved by the base. I, I wonder if this goes up bell. <laughs> in Wyoming. <laughs> but maybe, maybe Colorado you, you, or Nevada. That's you, you, got, you got a shot there. I prefer the, is it something warm weather uh, I like. You like Arizona? I mean, you know, the home of Jeff Flake and John McCain. Maybe you have a shot there. Arizona could be good. Uh, South Florida could be nice. Okay, so if Scott um, Brown can run in his vacation state, I don't see why you can't. That's right. Uh, I actually, you know, I sort of have a claim to for, you know, mom, mom lives in Pennsylvania. I'm from Maryland. I went to college in West Virginia and I live in Virginia. So that's sort of my, uh, you know, that, that's my obvious, uh, you know, Mitt Romney had five or six home states. <laughs> I guess I have four. Um, but I want a warm weather state as my home state. So, yeah. Again, uh, I, you know, I'm never going to run for anything, but uh, this tape will be destroyed. <laughs> Whispering in your ear. <laughs> well, you said you're going to be there. If they ever come knocking on my door, you're going to try to, you know, help me out, be on my side, you're fighting for me every step of the way. So I remember that. <laughs> three or four years ago. We've been doing this for a long time. It's been a long time. So, well, until next week, sir. All right. Good to see you. Uh, check us out on Facebook, on the Twitter at DMZ Show, and we'll see you right back here next week in the DMZ.